Thank you to Grammarly for sponsoring this video. Are we gonna pull out the whiteboard? Is that unnecessary? No, of course not. If I was a villain, this would be my lair. For some reason, the tail, no, too much for me. The hooves, I'm okay with it. We'll just compare them so that you know what to expect and know if it's gonna be for you. Hello, welcome back to my channel. My name's Leonie. So the past few months, a bunch of super highly anticipated books came out. New releases that were so hyped, James Cameron would be very jealous. Now the thing about hype books is that they can often raise your expectations so high that you get a little disappointed by the book. And having a book that you've been looking forward for years be disappointing? I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. So in this video, I will be reading a bunch of highly anticipated new releases and we'll chat a little bit about which one of these books are good so that you know what to expect from them. I'll quickly show you the books I'm going to be reading and I'll give more detail later into the video. The first one, <laughs> of course, is going to be Hellbent, the sequel to Ninth House because we've been waiting for three years. The Demon in the Woods came out two months ago. Lee Bardugo's graphic novel with the origin story of the Darkling. And I'm also gonna be reading The Stolen Heir, which is the sequel to the Cruel Prince trilogy. But before I read The Stolen Heir, I will be reading the last book in the Cruel Prince trilogy, The Queen of Nothing, because a lot of you guys have been asking me what I think of this kind of controversial last book in the trilogy. I'm excited. But first, a word from our sponsor, Grammarly. When it comes to work, having good written communication is crucial to your professional relationships. And Grammarly can help with that communication. Increase your productivity with their free writing suggestions. Or get the premium deal to reframe your tone as more confident. I'm someone who's always struggled with sounding confident in my written communication. I remember when I was doing my master's internship and I was emailing my supervisor, I would always pad my emails with these things like, oh, maybe if we could potentially, if you think it's also good. And that would just really downplay my own ideas. Grammarly Premium's confident framing can help with that. Their tone suggestions ensure that you come across as confident, capable, and sure. If I had had this tool when I was doing my internship, it would have saved me so much time staring at my screen, wondering how I come across and if my message can be misinterpreted. It also would have made me feel more confident in myself. You can download Grammarly, which easily integrates into your daily life. It works where you work, such as Google Docs, Microsoft Word, to ensure that your tone is coming across the way you want it to. The right tone can move your projects further with the use of Grammarly. Go to grammarly.com slash thebookleo to sign up for an account. And if you would like to level up your writing and tone, upgrade to Grammarly Premium for 20% off. Thanks to Grammarly for sponsoring this video. I have been waiting for this book for three years. I distinctly remember at the beginning of 2020, I had just rekindled my love for reading and I read Ninth House by Lee Verdugo. This dark story about hell and the occult and secret societies at Yale and it became an instant new favorite. And the sequel just didn't come and it didn't come and it didn't come. Now, it's three years later, my reading tastes have definitely changed, but here I finally have Hellbent by Lee Bardugo. This is Lee Bardugo's first adult fantasy series. It takes place in the current world at Yale University, but all the secret societies at Yale University use some kind of occult magic. And our main character is part of the Ninth House, which is supposed to keep them in check, but somehow they do kind of end up going on a heist to hell in this book. <laughs> what I can tell you about this book so far is Please, dear God, read a summary of Ninth House before you get into this one or reread the entirety of Ninth House. <laughs> it's very clear from the first 50 pages that there's this assumption that you still perfectly remember everything that happened in Ninth House and still remember everyone's name um, and nothing will be explained to you. Maybe I'll link uh, a summary 
in the description that I used. Lee Bardugo is yet again proving that she is the master at describing magical situations. I'm reading this book super, super slowly, by the way, and that is because the way everything is described, all the things that are happening just play out as these elaborate scenes in my mind because Lee Bardugo is just so good at creating a vision for the reader. And that's what makes her books so immersive. Hello. Have you ever just read for a very long time and feel like you've just awoken from a coma? Because that's what I, how I feel right now. I've almost finished this. I'm almost finished. I'm still trying to emotionally recover from big fights, big, big scenes. <laughs> I will say, I do think unfortunately that this book relies a lot on convenience like towards the end although it's all super badass it's just convenience after convenience after convenience and opportunities and powers that seem to spring out of nothing but still <laughs> let me go back to my coma and finish this book <laughs> uh, i think i just spent Six, I th what? Did I just read for six hours? I'm entering my post book breakdown right now. I know that I would never be disappointed by a Libra Dugo book. <laughs> Hello, don't mind me just dipping in from the future with a little tidbit, a little, little snippet of information that I thought would be interesting to share. I recently went to London and there I bought this book alchemy and mysticism and as you may know ninth house the entire series is very much influenced by like occult magic and mythology and as i was browsing through this book which is basically just a combination of all kinds of artworks alchemical al alchemical alchemistical mystical <laughs> artwork from alchemists with explanations of the artwork i came across a few things that are very prevalent in the entire ninth house series that are apparently well-known occultist symbolism i think the most obvious one is the serpent which plays a big role in ninth house not only on the cover the first book but just in general throughout the entire series serpents are constantly used as imagery but then i also found out that apparently the wheel is also a very common occultist aspect the wheel plays a huge role in the alex stern series and i thought this was just kind of something the libra dugo made up but it's interesting to see to what extent she took inspiration from these actual real um, alchemists and mystics Hello and welcome to hell. I want to talk about how Lee Bardugo writes her characters. Something that I've noticed at the beginning of Hellbent that also happened at the beginning of Ninth House and that a lot of people seem to agree on, that is that at the beginning of the story, nothing really hits. And it's mostly because I'm not that invested in the characters, especially the side characters in both Hellbent and Ninth House, don't really come to life. I am constantly forgetting who is who and forgetting people's names. And this is really odd considering that Lee Bardugo is kind of known for her good characters. And specifically reading Hellbent has made me realize something about how Lee Bardugo writes characters. So let's talk about it. I have a theory that Lee Bardugo only knows how to write good characters if she can write from that character's perspective. Let's compare the characters from each of Lee Bardugo's series. Are we gonna pull out the whiteboard? Is that unnecessary? No. Of course not. 
So in Six of Crows, we get the perspective of each main character and all of these characters truly come alive. But in Ninth House and the sequel Hellbent, we only get our main character's perspectives, Alex's perspective. But the interesting thing that happens in Hellbent, uh, and that is that there, I won't spoil, but there's a brief moment in which we get the perspective of a few of the side characters. And that moment in the book shifted my entire experience. Just a brief moment of getting their perspective suddenly made these characters burst off the page. But it made me think, in Libra Duo's first series, Shadow and Bone, we also only get the main character, Alina's point of view, and still people really do enjoy the characters in this book. And I realized it's because in Shadow and Bone, a high fantasy story, Lee Verdugo can really rely on having these character concepts to distinguish all the side characters from each other. For example, we have the character with the swords, or the pirate character, or, you know, the character that can literally create darkness. Yeah. I'll remember him. <laughs> also in Shadow and Bone, Libra Dugo relies a lot on just using archetypes, which is a pretty cheap but effective way to tell your characters apart, like the mean girl character and the harsh general character. What I really like about Libra Dugo is that you can really tell her progression of writing throughout all the series that she's written. In Ninth House, Libra Dugo really strays away from using these archetypal characters and it makes the story feel a lot more mature and realistic and less formularic. What I'm trying to say is that when Libra Dugo wrote the Six of Crows duology, she kind of used both of her best assets, which is being in the characters' heads, having the characters' POVs, and working with these cool fantasy character concepts without having to go for archetypes. For example, the cool guy that is the sharpshooter or the shadowy acrobatic girl with the knives. But in Ninth House, Lee Bardugo doesn't have the opportunity for these cool fantasy concept characters because we're just in real life at Yale University. Um, and she chose to not write from the character's perspective only the main character. You can immediately tell that she starts struggling bringing her side characters to life. But if you're reading Hellbent and you're kind of struggling with the same thing, don't worry. It just takes Lee Bardugo a little bit of more time to really flesh out the side characters. And you know, you have 500 pages of reading this book and towards the end, they really do come to life, especially because we get like a little bit, a little bit of their perspective. My overall thoughts of this book is that I really enjoyed it. Despite its slow start, this book definitely pulled through. Yes, it was riddled with convenient moments, but Libra Dugo was so good at raising the stakes, giving the characters these badass abilities. I think you would still absolutely love the series if you enjoy a little bit of occult, paranormal, magical things happening. So I will still give it four stars, definitely. I will say though, Last thing I want to say, this book, not even close in darkness to Ninth House. Like Ninth House, from what I remember, was extremely dark and graphic. And this one, barely, just a little, just a little. So don't go into this expecting the same level of darkness as Ninth House is, because it doesn't at all, like not even close. <laughs> this book's actually pretty tame, but do look up the trigger warnings, of course, just to be safe. I can't believe I finished Hellbent. I've been waiting for this book for three years and then suddenly it's over. Well, guess we're just gonna move on to reading another Lee Bardugo story. <laughs> I've always had a predilection for a good villain. The very first high fantasy series I ever read is Shadow and Bone. So naturally the villain in this story has really stuck with me. The Darkling, this dark wizard? <laughs> and as someone who loves villains, I can never say no to a good villain origin story. And Lee Bardugo has written the short story, The Demon in the Wood, which actually already 
exist for a very long time, but last year they came out with a graphic novel depicting this villain origin story. I've never read the original short story, so I'm going to experience it for the first time in this graphic novel. Um, but before I read it, I just want to show you something that I always find very interesting about graphic novels, and that is the color story that is used because uh, often the change in color in the panels can already tell you something about the vibe of the story. And something that I immediately see in The Demon in the Wood is that there is a very strong green and red color scheme that slowly becomes more and more red and eventually at the end turns purple, like the cover. Purple, like the darkness that the darkling can create. I'm going in completely blind. I have no idea what his origin story is, so let's see. Hi. That actually got surprisingly intense. <laughs> A bit dark, maybe. You know, a candle always really gives way more light than you would think. It is time to talk about the demon in the wood. I was pleasantly surprised in some aspects and a little disappointed in other. I like her longer stories, maybe I should really start reading her shorter stories, which I've never read because The Demon in the Wood as a story, very well done. There's a very interesting power dynamic between our main character, the Darkling, and his mother. And you can clearly see that he just does everything that she teaches him to do. And I'm gonna be honest, this story, like I, like I said, the story was surprisingly, um, Although the art style is really pretty in its art, I will say that I found the panels to be kind of stilted and lacking in dynamics. And because of that, it was sometimes unclear to me which movements the characters were actually making. That being said, I would recommend this if you know that you like Lee Bardugo's story writing. I think especially if you think short stories aren't really for you in graphic novel form, it's a great way to get acquainted with the short story format. And just generally, if you really are interested in villainous characters, especially the Darkling from Shadow and Bone, I think this is a staple. I will say though that this book is not a villain origin story. Maybe I just got it wrong that I expected that it would be, but it's more just like one small story that you can see plants a seed in the Darkling for becoming a villain later on in life. It's not like a full villain origin story. The story just teaches you a little bit more about the motivation of our villain. I just love villains. <laughs> if I was a villain, this would be my lair. I'm sure of it. Oh, hello, how are you doing? <laughs> oh, I cannot be trusted with these candles. Hello. Okay. Now before I move on to the very highly anticipated release of The Stolen Air, I first want to take a little bit of time for me to read The Queen of Nothing. And I know that this is technically not at all a hyped new release. How old is this? It came out in 2020. <laughs> and I wanted to include me reading this book in this video because it's the finale to the Folk of the Air series where The Stolen Air is the sequel for. And a lot of you guys have been asking me what my opinion is on the last book in the Folk of the Air trilogy, especially because the last book in this series seems to be a little bit controversial. A lot of people are kind of disappointed in it. So that's why I thought it would be fun for me to also share my experience reading this book in this video right before we move on to the stolen air. Okay, that's it.
I'm gonna be honest, so far, I do not understand why people are being so negative about this one. This book, yet again, just shows where the folk of the air truly shines, which in my opinion is the interactions between the characters. And interactions between characters are always the best later in the series, because then you've already had so much build-up and had so much time to get to know each character. What I mean with that is that Holly Black has succeeded at really making you care about the characters because she puts so much focus on making sure that every character has a point of tension with every other character, with our main character Jude being in the middle of all of those. She has tension with Cardin, the prince, and the love interest, obviously, but she also has a lot of tension with her father, and she also had a lot of tension with her sister. Especially those last two, the family dynamics in this book are so well done because you can really feel this tension of Jude being angry at her family members for treating her very poorly, but in the end, they're still her family. And it's these kind of tense interactions between the characters that absolutely propel this entire series forward. And they're still here in the last book, so I don't really... I don't know, I'm, I'm still loving this one. I don't see why people don't like this one. Okay, I think I do actually understand now why people might not like this last book in the series. I finished The Queen of Nothing, we will talk about what I thought of it and then I will also talk in general about the Folk of the Air trilogy and whether you should read it or not. And as I do that, I want to do my makeup in a kind of fairy-like way because in this series the Fae are constantly described as being these like ethereal beings with like gold on their cheekbones and I'm like, I want to have gold on my cheekbones. And then I realized I can just do that. So I already have like my normal everyday makeup look done, but we're gonna make it a little bit more fairy-like as I talk about the queen of nothing. What earrings are more fairy-like? I have these swords that are very Jude-like, but I think the golden sun and moon are going to fit the gold a little better. Maybe I should just do the makeup first. I still think that this is a great conclusion to the series. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> but I do understand why people would be a little bit disappointed in the ending, which I was as well. This looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> We're just gonna roll with it. So what Holly Black clearly is trying to do in this book is the whole third book in the trilogy, so there has to be a big battle kind of thing, but that just, doesn't work for this series. It feels like it j it's just there because, you know, it's the last book in a trilogy and last books in trilogies need to have a big war battle. But the great thing about the Folk of the Air series so far is that it was never this grand scale fantasy story. It was always just about the political intrigue and the court relationships between the characters. It was never a story of this group against that group. It has always been a small scale web of politics and shifting alliances. And that's why I thought that the big war at the end felt kind of out of place and didn't really fit with the tone of the rest of the series. It's not even that gold. Like if you look at my finger, that looks gold. But on my face, it looks orange. <laughs> I'm gonna put it on the inside of my eyes as well. Another thing that I do want to mention because I know you guys are gonna ask for it because it's a pretty famous scene uh, in the last book is there's a kind of a smutty scene. Uh, what I really like about the romance in the, the Folk of the Air series is that it does such a good job at not just being romance or kissing or whatever, but really being there to show the shifting power dynamics between Jude and Cardin. And I think the romance scenes in The Queen of Nothing did that so well. That being said, however, I still really could have done without the tale. <laughs> Sometimes I kind of wonder if Holly Black went with the tail thing because the wing thing worked so well for Sarah J Maas um, but the, it, it's, it's not the same. That being said, the wing thing also never worked for me so maybe I'm just not furry. <laughs> now I don't have any 
fairy ears, but I did saw someone on TikTok that always highlights her ears to still kind of get that feeling of having fairy ears. I just have a lot of glitter on my face right now. As long as you just don't look at it up close, it's pretty fine. I actually think the daggers work better. Final question, of course, is should you read the Folk of the Air trilogy? I think you should definitely read the Folk of the Air series if you like mean fairy characters that backstab each other and betray each other and have a lot of court intrigue. If you enjoy indulging in a lavish fey world. If you would like the literary equivalent of having glitter all over your face. <laughs> and lastly, if you enjoy reading about very interesting and tense family dynamics, I think that is where this series shines and not enough people are talking about it. Everyone's talking about Jude and Carden, which yes, also read this if you love any enemies to lovers, but the family dynamics, the character interactions, Holly Black, I love you! <laughs> but now, of course, what you guys are all waiting for is for me to read The Stolen Heir, the sequel duology to the Folk of the Air trilogy. Hello lovelies. Okay, so The Stolen Air is the sequel to the Folk of the Air trilogy and takes place about 10 years in the future when Oak, the crown prince of Elfheim. Or Elfheimae. When I was listening to the audiobook, the narrator kept pronouncing it as Elfheimae. But to me, it makes more sense to pronounce it as Elfheim. How do you guys pronounce it? Is it Elfheimae? Elfheim? But the main character that we follow is Surin, the puppet queen of the Court of Teeth, that we've seen a little bit in the Folk of the Air trilogy, but this one is really supposed to be about her. Before I start, I just want to pay some attention to how beautifully designed these books are. Look at just the opening poem and the little illustrations. And I love the little map that we get in this one, also filled with these whimsical little drawings. Even the chapter headers are pretty. Even the page breaks are little, see? They're tiny swords and it just fits the vibe of the book so well. Anyway, I'm gonna read this book now because hell no, I'm not gonna go outside with this makeup. So I guess I'll just stay inside and read this book and I'll give you updates as I read. I think what's really interesting so far about The Stone Air is that as opposed to The Cruel Prince, we have a main character that is fey and therefore cannot lie and having a main character that is incapable of lying adds such an interesting extra point of tension to the story. Like normal interrogation scenes, for example, there's always a kind of expectation when you read an interrogation scene. We've kind of seen them very often in books, but if there's an interrogation scene in a book like this where the main character and no one else can lie, it completely shifts the dynamic in a scene like that. And that's super interesting. Consider me even more of a Holly Black fan now, because I think she's a genius. Okay, let, let us set the scene first. Let's light this candle. There we go. Vibes. Also, I wore these, wore these mushroom earrings to kind of get more into the fairy vibe, because I just want to be in the fairy vibe all the time now. As if covering my face in glittery eyeshadow wasn't fairy-esque enough for me, apparently. I'm almost halfway into the book, and to me so far, Holly Black has managed to write a perfectly typical YA fantasy story, but completely turn around and put on its head a lot of the standard tropes that are being used in it. For example, and this all happens in the prologue, so it's not a spoiler, Holly Black really shifts the narrative of the trope of, oh, a very plain, normal human girl finds out that she is secretly magical and royalty. Because our main character, Ren, or Surin, finding out that she is actually a fake queen ruins her life 
It's horrible to her that she no longer belongs with who she thought her parents were. She doesn't belong with her sister anymore and her family hates her when they find out that she is a creepy fae. And her true family, the fae, just use her as a puppet queen. There's even a line in the book where Ren's real parents tell her that she's actually fae. Um, and I know, like Holly Black knew what she was doing here. She says, this is page three. We're going to fairyland where you will be a queen. Have you never dreamed of someone coming to you and telling you that you were no mortal child, but made of magic? Have you never dreamed about being taken from your pathetic little life to one of vast greatness? Which is pretty much the dream that a lot of YA fantasy stories like this play into. So I really like that Holly Black was like, let's take that and then make it horrible for our main character. Another common trope that Holly Black is turning around in this book is the trope of the normal, weird, plain girl who falls in love with the golden and charming prince. But she really takes it to the extremes. Like yes, our main character Ren is kind of a weird main character that no boy is interested in, but that's because she's a blue fey monster with pointy teeth that lives feral in the woods. <laughs> and yes, our love interest, Prince Oak, is indeed a golden boy, loved by everyone, adored by women. But, and I can't tell why because those would be spoilers, but yet again, Holly Black takes it to its extreme and makes it a little more sinister than that. I just love YA fantasy books that turn common tropes on its head while still being unapologetically catering to teenage girls and just being like a fun fantasy story. Also, I, I, again, I just gotta give Holly Black props for writing a story where the main character is a blue-skinned fey monster that lives feral in the woods and the love interest has hooves. <laughs> you know, like a fawn. Like he has hooves. I'm okay with it. Maybe I... Remember when I said that I wasn't a furry? <laughs> for some reason, the tail? No, too much for me. The hooves? I'm okay with it. <laughs> I blame James McAvoy as Mr. Tumnus from the first Narnia movie. Good morning. This book also has its traditional YA fantasy makeover scene, but that one's also done a little bit differently. It strays away from the typical, oh, you're very ugly now, but now you're gonna get a makeover and you'll be perfectly in line with all the beauty standards. It doesn't do that either. And I like seeing all the tropes being diverged. Here's like one. Here's what the woman who gives our main character Ren a makeover says at the end. Uh, fix your hair, she says, then shrugs again. Or make it wilder. You look lovely either way. I think it's a crime to humanity that Holly Black hasn't released the sequel yet. I know this book came out 30 days ago, but I need book two. <laughs> I woke up very sick this morning, so I was just rolled up in my bed like a little gremlin just finishing this book. <laughs> And I loved it. I will say I predicted the plot twist at the end of the book already about halfway in. I thought they, but I'm not like mad about it because it was, it was heavily foreshadowed, but not in an annoying way, more in a like, ooh, I kind of feel good that I predicted the plot twist kind of way. I think what rests me now is to do a little comparison between the Folk of the Air series and the Stolen Air because I think a lot of people are mostly just thinking is the Stolen Air like the Cruel Prince since it's a sequel? Um, the short answer is no. The long answer we will discuss right now. <laughs> I think a lot of people will be disappointed in The Stolen Air if you expect it to be just like The Cruel Prince. Because it's really just not. It's a very different story with a very different tone. And I will, uh, we'll just compare them so that you know what to expect and know if it's gonna be for you. I think the main thing to know about The Stolen Air is that it's a quest plot line. So we just spend time with their characters as they are journeying through the fairy country, going on this quest to the Court of Thieves. I really love journey stories, but I think to the people who 
that's just really not their thing are gonna find the stone air maybe a little bit boring i personally thought it was really fun that we got to see so much more of the fairylands with all these different fae creatures and different characters that you get to know uh, because it's a quest storyline but it does give the story a very different from than cruel prince which was mostly just about court intrigue i think like most of these books just take place at the Elfheim High Court. And although the Stolen Air definitely has a lot of intrigue, political games in it as well, there's just more to it. More, more frolicking through fairyland. <laughs> Another thing coursing through the veins of the Cruel Prince is of course the Jude Carden enemies to lovers storyline. Although it's very low on the romance, the very vile enemies to lovers thing that Jude and Carden have going on really sets a lot of the tone for the story. And just know that you're just not gonna get that in the Stolen Air. I would describe the romance in the Stolen Air as yearning old friends to lovers and it's also more medium on the romance instead of low i feel like the romance definitely plays a higher role in the stolen air um, because a lot of the plot is also kind of attached to it i'm gonna be fully honest i didn't really feel the vibe between ren and oak after finishing it i'm very interested in seeing where it's going it makes sense for the characters it's well developed but I personally, it, it didn't really sizzle the way. I mean, nothing beats Jude and Carden, to be honest. But it, the, Ren and Oak, they don't even come close. They don't even come close. They do not come close at all, at all. Now, dare I say, and this may be a controversial opinion, but I do think the characters in the Stolen Air better that in The Cruel Prince. Oak is such a fascinating prince character, but especially Ren her character development unmatched and she becomes unhinged where i think the stone and air really shines as with its a plus characters uh the cruel prince i think shines the most because it's just a plus addictive <laughs> In the end, I do think that I enjoyed The Cruel Prince more than The Stolen Air because The Cruel Prince just has this addictive enjoyment factor to it uh, that The Stolen Air doesn't have. But still, 4 out of 5 stars, just make sure that you see it as its own thing and don't expect it to be a copy of The Cruel Prince because then you will be disappointed. So we've read Hellbent, The Demon in the Woods, I finished the Folk of Air series, and I also have read The Stone Air. I think this, this video is really just an excuse for me to talk more about Lieber Dugo and Holly Black, which I think I would call my two favorite authors now. I would love to know what you guys thought of these books. If you were disappointed in any way by any of these hype new releases, I hope not. <laughs> if you enjoyed chatting with me about these books and you would like to see more videos, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. And that's all I have to say. Thank you for spending your time with me again today i'm pretty sure the video is a little bit pretty long <laughs> but i'm really glad that you made it to the end i hope you have a wonderful rest of your day whatever it is that you're going to be doing and i will see you soon in another video next week goodbye